tons of uh, pieces because it became such a popular pattern. So, and they some of the things that they made released are fantastic. So check this out. I mean, could this be any more mid? I mean, this is a pair of lungs. I, they call it a relish dish, but it's lungs. Um, but it's like, so you've got this great angular shape. You see this on a kidney shaped coffee table. You can put your lungs with your kidney. Uh, well, if you got a dollar, well, just lousy down. Know that I got rhythm that could suit your budget found. You can take or leave it. Hey, this is Patrick with Trusty Extra Mercantile. And welcome to my channel. If you follow my Instagram channel, I'm a little bit more active there, particularly lately than I have been on YouTube. But uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you will have seen over the last few weeks, I have joined a, uh, for lack of a better term, a challenge uh, that's been uh, put out by McGillicuddy on Instagram. Uh, she happens to be local to me. I do not know her, uh, but she is, uh, she is a location in Warehouse 55, one of my favorite haunts uh, locally. But anyway, she has this, uh, the quest is the best challenge that she puts out. And I think she does it every year, not 100% sure on that, but uh, just started, the most recent one just started a few weeks ago. It is an alphabetical uh, highlights of your collection. Uh, a by A, B, C, D. Uh, this most recent week was D. And I did dishes. And the dishes that I chose were my Bob White pattern from Red Wing Pottery. And the dishes are something I use on a regular basis. Uh, the dinner plates and the little lunch and salad plates are my daily dishes. But I also have a lot of serving pieces that I've collected that go along with them. And so I kind of put them all out. And for some of them, it's the first time they'd been out. I was actually pulling uh, price tags off of some of them as I put them up for the picture and uh, put them out. And I got a really a positive response from it. A lot of people had not seen the pattern before. A lot of people were surprised that I had anything that even remotely resembled mid-century modern because that's not really my aesthetic. Uh, but I've just always really liked the pattern. I like the colors in them, just like the design. And it was just something fun and relatively easy to collect. Uh, Red Wing Pottery is a Minnesota-based company, and as I'm based outside Chicago, it's relatively local. So uh, Red Wing is, is fairly heavy in the Midwest. But once all of this stuff was sitting out and people were commenting on the look and commenting on the patterns, I started thinking, you know what? I haven't done a Trustees Deep Dive in quite some time. So welcome back to Trustees, Trustees Vintage Deep Dive. Now, this may be more of a shallow dive because I don't have an expert that I can cross-reference with, uh, but I went digging and had uh, actually some books and some information. And of course, the internet is always a fun rabbit hole to go down because if it's on the internet, you know it's true. Uh, but I did try and piece together enough information that at least talks about Red Wing a little bit and then talks about this pattern. And hopefully it makes it somewhat interesting. So I do want to talk about Red Wing. What I will be talking about specifically is the Red Wing Bob White pattern. But I'm going to back up a little bit and just talk about Red Wing in general. So Red Wing itself is a lot, is a very old company. It's a 19th century company. So it was originally founded to create, coincidentally enough, the same type of stoneware that I collect now. Fair, uh, absolute upfront, uh, being honest, I do not collect Red Wing Crocs. They are very popular. They are very collectible. Um, I do not research them. I'm not familiar with them. Uh, there's one like right here on the cover. They all have, in my opinion, based on the experience that I have, they all have a very similar look and is not a look that I like. Um, my stoneware tends to be from the East Coast. Most of it's from Southwest Pennsylvania. I like the blue ground almost exclusively. Red Wing has the brown ground. Uh, and the patterns don't have as uh, unique, in my opinion, again, in my opinion, it does not have as unique or as interesting of cobalt design as some of the ones that I have in my current collection. No harm, no foul. No, uh, there's no issues with it. I just don't collect them. So it is somewhat interesting that a company that built itself up building stoneware crocs and I currently use their dishes. I don't do anything with their actual Crocs. Uh, so I did do a little bit of digging and found out a little bit about the history of the company. 
So the company itself was founded in 1876 in Red Wing, Minnesota, which is about an hour-ish southeast of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, kind of uh, kind of near the Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota borders, if you want to like dust off the recesses of your American geography. Um, so again, it's probably from here, it's maybe from where I live, it's probably about a four and a half, five hour drive. And I have actually been to Red Wing. The factory, what uh, the most... The last factory that they had, I'll go a little bit into the detail of the company, uh, it does actually still exist. The building is still there. Um, so it, there is still something to be able to see. But the company started in the 19th century specifically to create the stoneware. It did go through a couple of name changes. Uh, it was the Red Wing Stoneware Company, and then in 1906 became the Red Wing Union Stoneware Company. I think Union might have been a separate company at some point, and they merged. Not 100% clear on that. There are a couple of places that you can find this. There is an active collector's guild. I am not a member of it, but a lot of their information is on site uh, or on the on, online. Uh, so I did find uh, several posts. Interestingly, a lot of the posts on the history, because the company is now effectively defunct as a manufacturer, it's older history. And so it got a little dicey as you got into some of the more contemporary things that started happening. But uh, most of them, some of them split between the union and the stoneware, and some of them just kind of combined that together. So anyway, uh, that carried you into the 1930s. The 1930s is where they started moving away from just the storage crocs, so just the types of stoneware that I'm collecting you know, behind me, they started getting into doing dinnerware in the 30s. Uh, and they started doing that with uh, several different patterns, and some of those patterns existed for quite some time. But they did continue to make stoneware, the crocs, but that ended in the 40s. So there's a little bit of an overlap. But once they started doing the dinnerware, it became Red Wing Potteries. And it is plural. Now, there's that's also something that, depending on where you look, that name gets mixed up a little bit. Historically, as you look into most of the writings, it does differentiate that at that time in 1936, it was Red Wing Potteries, uh, which existed through 1967. Unfortunately, in 1967, there was a labor dispute and there was uh, uh, evidently a strike of some sort. And during the strike, as they were trying to negotiate with the workers, factory shut down and it effectively ceased to exist in 1967. Now, the, some of the executive team uh, did try and buy out some of the inventory, you know, kind of to keep it a little bit going, but no longer as a manufacturer. And so that appears to be the time when the, the terms Red Wing Pottery, just the word pottery, came about because it was more of a retail uh, yeah, development at that point. Interestingly, when you look at, and I will get into this in more detail, but when you look at the markings on most of the pieces, it just says Red Wing. So that's why there's a little bit of a discrepancy because colloquially, potteries, pottery, they're going to get mixed and matched. Uh, so I did try and find a couple of different places, and that appears to be the consensus, is it started as Red Wing potteries, and then once it became a retail environment, it became Red Wing pottery. And then that existed for a while. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, some of the history that was written is some older history. And when the collector's guild first started uh, uh, coming into existence, things started changing. So there were some names that tried to uh, get, um, that changed around a little bit. Some of the other information I found was some things happened in the 80s in 1984, a man named Falconer, which I just think is a cool name. Um, took over the company or bought the company or invested in the company. Again, a little unclear on some of it and named it at that time, kind of returned it back to its original name of the Red Wing Stoneware Company because the stoneware from the collector's side appears to be what has the biggest attraction. Uh, it's older, it gets in the 19th century. You know, there, there definitely is um, a good history in that. So I think he tried to maybe recreate um, that original name, I'm, I'm looking down because I'm looking at my notes. Um, so like one of the one of the references that I found said to present, but that was written in 2014. So some things happened after 2014, uh, which are a little bit unclear. Uh, the one thing that is clear is that although the building still exists, it was turned into sort of apartments and some office and restaurants. There was a great antique store and I actually have shopped at the antique store and got a couple of the pieces I'm gonna show you uh, from the antique shop that was in the original Red Wing manufacturing building. Uh, 
they are no longer located there. Uh, so there, but there is a uh, evidently a retail store outside of the town of Red Wing, and that may still exist. There is an active uh, Facebook account for them as of March of 2024. But I'm a little unclear. I don't think they're manufacturing anything anymore, but I wouldn't swear to that. So I'm not really going to talk a lot about the contemporary side because what I'm talking about, specifically focusing on the Bob White, that did end in 1967. So although things happened, there was some retail, it was just selling inventory that was still around at that time. Nothing new was manufactured and no new designs were created. So that kind of brings us up to what I want to cover. And again, I'm going to skip over all of the stoneware. I'm sure there are some great videos out there that do cover that. But what I want to focus on is, again, what I was showing in the Bob White pattern. Or, well, is the dinnerware manufacturing and then specifically the Bob White. Now, when they started manufacturing, they did a couple smart things in creating their dinnerware. And again, I cross-reference this book. Red Wing Pottery with Rum Rill. Uh, it was originally copyrighted, oh, there it is, copyrighted 1980, values were updated in 1982. So we're not going to talk about values at all. Uh, a lot of this is going to be available on, um, you can find them on online on eBay. Um, there are a couple of these pieces I might have found on eBay, but they tend to be heavy, they tend to be bigger, um, so shipping is some type of an issue. But he does a really nice job talking about Red Wing as a whole and giving some really nice color photographs as you go through it. But what's really nice about it is he actually has a layout of some of the Red Wing pieces. I'm sorry, well, the Red Wing pieces, but specifically the Bob White um, pieces. And the other thing that he does, which is something really cool that they did at the time they kind of created their company, was they created different lines. So one of the things that they identified was the, this is probably more distinctive. This has a very distinctive shape to it. There's a, it's a beverage um, decanter, beverage, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, obviously it's a pitcher. It actually has a corked stopper on the top. If you look at the bottom, there's a, a little indent. And when I bought it, I didn't know what that little indent is for. It actually turns out it's because it's, there's a little metal cradle um, that you would put in and you could warm it. So it was actually to warm the coffee. Uh, but what they did was the bob white pattern was considered the casual shape so you can see but they had other lines that were also in the casual shape so they had the smart set they had what were the other casual uh the loot song the pompeii so these are all patterns that they offered and i will show some additional uh, images but here's another example you can see that copper stand uh, had a little casserole sitting on it, there's a casserole. And you can see there's, again, there's this little indent down here at the bottom that would have set in to that cradle. So cool, they did it for Bob White. That's what it looks like, but they did that across all of their lines. And with the other line that they did that with was the, uh, smart set. So if you look at this picture, it also exists in the smart set pattern. If you look really closely, you can see that indentation on the bottom. So it's not showing it in its cradle, but you can see the cork stopper uh, sitting there next to it. Same cork stopper right here. There's also a salt and pepper shaker in this exact same shape. I don't have that, but that was available. Uh, actually, that's yeah, right there, right next to it. So I've actually never seen that pattern in the wild. Um, I think it's, a, I'm not sure where uh, it dates. It got a little um, difficult to figure out how many pieces existed in all the different patterns. Uh, one of the things that I discovered is this pattern, the Bob White pattern, and I think I heft this book, U.S. Marks on Pottery, Porcelain, and Clay. You said it was a Goodwill find uh, for $1.99. They did a really nice job. They do talk about the show all the different um, back stamps that would have been on the pottery and on the stoneware, but some of these go back to the, the Crocs. Um, so what they pretty much talk about is that most of the dinnerware patterns or back stamps were about the same. 
but it does give a nice breakdown of when every individual pattern came out and which line it was a part of. So the Bob White pattern was part of the casual shape of the casual line. Now this says it came out in 1956. I found another reference that said 1956. However, it could not have come out in 1956. It had to have come out before that. So I found another reference that said it came out in 1954 and I believe the 1954 reference and there's a very specific reason for it. Bob White became one of the most popular patterns available between 1954 slash 56 through the time it was still available at the time they shut down in 1967. And one of the reasons it was uh, what they viewed as being the reason it wasn't so popular was, and I cannot believe I'm gonna talk about this on my channel, it was part of a Playboy centerfold layout in February of 1956. So the February 1956 issue would have been being planned at the end of 1955. It's entirely possible it would have been shot at the end of 1955. So this pattern could not have been released in 1956. Mathematically, it just wouldn't have happened because one, someone would have had to have sourced this. It would have had to have already been in stores at the time they did the photo shoot. So even if it was in January, it's, it's unlikely this was something that was available the very first day of January of 1956. So it is reverse engineering, it's, it's, it's guesstimating, it's, it's an educated guess, uh, but there is a reference saying 54, separate reference saying 56, but one of the references that said 56 was saying it was the top selling pattern in 1956, and this book is now re re repeating the 1956 reference. So it's one of those cases, once you see it in one place, it pops up in all these other places. So it, one place said 54, this place said 56, I can't find a definitive answer for that, but there are some fantastic advertisements that just prove this definitely was mid fifties. It was definitely mid-century modern because some of the advertising is just so much of its period. And thanks to some of the advertising, you can actually see how many of these patterns became available uh, because some of the patterns didn't come out like this book shows, uh, like there were some patterns that actually came out in 1967. That was the year it shut down. So those patterns, there aren't that many pieces out there because they probably made the dinner plates and maybe some of the more popular like coffee, you know, maybe even the coffee pot, but coffee mugs and, and saucers, but they may not have gone all the way into some of the beverage centers because it just wasn't around for very long. Bob White was around for a really long time. And I will say as a pattern, there were a lot of people that said, oh, I've never seen that pattern before. I, I can't say that it's common. I mean, you have to be looking for vintage dishes but at least here in the Midwest, it's common enough. I see it fairly often, particularly the the, the uh, coffee um, the coffee cups and saucers. The coffee cups are minuscule. They're like little Barbie coffee cups as far as what we are used to in today's day and age. Um, so I don't actually even have any of the coffee cups because I, if I'm gonna drink coffee, I need more than four ounces. So those, I don't have any of those, but they're very, they're very prevalent. And they ended up releasing tons of uh, pieces because it became such a popular pattern. So, and they, some of the things that they made released are fantastic. So check this out. I mean, could this be any more mid, I mean, this is a pair of lungs. I, they call it a relish dish, but it's lungs. Um, but it's like, so you've got this great angular shape. You this on a kidney shaped coffee table. You can put your lungs with your kidney, uh, like a kidney shaped coffee table, just sitting there off on the side with all your little crudités and uh, appetizers for your little cocktail party. Um, so the pattern of the actual Bob White quails, they're obviously unique to this, but this shape would have shown up in many other uh, patterns. And one of the things in doing a little bit of the research there are back stamps uh, that go along with some of them, but most of the back stamps simply just existed through the 50s and the 60s. So it's kind of hard to figure out exactly when something was made. Uh, but it does seem that when this is actually done into the mold, so the actual mold had the red wing and there's no other mark on the back, this does appear to be a little bit later. So this one was probably released in the 60s. Doesn't mean it was designed in the 60s, just by the time they made this one, the mold started having red wing impressed into it. Where with most of the pieces, um, you know, like this, you know, check out the lip on this vegetable bowl, you've got a stamped, uh, back stamp. So there's two different designs. This one's a little bit later. 
it's that red wing in a curved printed text. And the one that's earlier that probably dates this to the 50s is the one that actually has a pinkish red wing on it with the word USA and the model number, mold number on the bottom. So uh, that is on several of the pieces that I have uh, split between those two. Uh, just showing you some other examples, the little salad plates, same thing. Got the, the, this one has the curve. This one has the red wing. And these are all hand painted. So it's like kind of fun when you put them side by side to see, okay, the designs are fairly similar, but when they did the little blue dandelion, you know, how, where did they draw the bottom versus how far did those feather tops come off a little badminton uh, shuttlecock? You know, they're all a little, just a little bit different. The dots in the bird, there's always going to be the same number of dots, but how they got laid out is sometimes a little bit different. So it just depends on who, who designed them or who's the artist at the time. From what I've seen, none of them have ever been signed, never found it in initials. I mean, these were done in such high production. I, I they, they are hand painted, but they were not a work of art. You know, these are just very, very almost not really stylistic, but you know, yeah, you can say that that's a quail. You could also say it's a chicken. You could also say it's a morning dove. You know, it's like at this point, what is that? Um, but they all have the same type of look. So the reddish back stamp a little bit older than the blue print back stamp. And then there was another uh, back stamp which got introduced and I couldn't find any reference that showed when this one would have been introduced, but instead of being curved, it has the scripted Bob White. So it's straight. So I'm thinking that this is probably the latest of the three, um, just because it seems the least artistic. Uh, but it says Bob White by Red Wing, detergent proof, oven proof. Uh, I don't think the other ones all said that. Um, the other one, this one says Red Wing, hand painted, oven proof, but not, it doesn't say anything about detergent proof. So the dinner, I mean, this entire collection started as a result of dinner plates. Um, I was doing a Facebook marketplace pickup uh, for a bunch of other things. And as part of, you know, there, there was a big barn of a resellers barn and they just stashes of things all over the place. And this was sitting on the workbench near what I was there to pick up. And I'm like, Ooh, what are those? And it ended up being 10 dinner plates for 10 bucks. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know who made them. I mean, I could see it was made by Red Wing, but I didn't know anything about them. Didn't know anything about the value, but I figured for a buck a plate, they're well made. They're they're heavy. These are ceramic, not porcelain. Um, you can also some of them are more obvious than others. See if I can find one that's more obvious. Yeah, this one because they're ceramic. The way they're fired, they're on stilt marks. So when you run your finger across the back, you will you will feel where the stilt actually hit it, and so it's a mark where the glaze appears. Like oh, the glaze is chipped off. No. It's a stilt mark and you should find, as you go across them, you should find three of them. So there's one here, there's one here, and there's one there. You're always gonna find stilt, stilt marks as a rule come in sets of three. My mother used to run a ceramic studio. So I've loaded and unloaded many kiln in my life. Um, so when you get into ceramic glazing, you have to have something that makes sure that this doesn't glue itself onto the shelf. So you have these little, they're little, um, usually porcelain themselves with little metal spikes that stick up. You literally would set that onto the three little spikes and the glaze would melt itself into um, solidity and it would melt itself onto where those stilt marks were, onto those little spiked stilts. So then you kind of like, sometimes they lift off nicely, sometimes you have to kind of like pry them off. And then you take a little stilt remover. I can't even remember. I can't believe I just remembered that term off the top of my head, but that's how ingrained it was in my growing up. Took a little stilt remover, which looked like a piece of chalk, but it was uh, much harder. And you just rubbed the, because usually the glaze would kind of like bubble up where it came off. You just rub it down a little bit and you get this mark. So anytime you're dealing with 
a stoneware manufacturer, a ceramic manufacturer that's entirely glazed, you will find stilt marks. They may be very well hidden. They're usually down at the bottom. So I always find it interesting that every dinner plate I've had, the stilt marks are all at the, on the edges of the rim. Uh, they're not down here. I don't know why that is, but that's the way it was. Um, and then, but the front should be entirely glazed because that's where your food is going to touch. So you wanted to make sure you didn't have a break in the uh, glaze to have foods to stain. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to upset a lot of people. I put these in the dishwasher all the time. I put them in the microwave all the time. I'm not going to have a piece of dinnerware in my house that I cannot clean in the dishwasher and use in the microwave. And I have not died yet. Um, now I won't, I do, did have some that over time, the very edges got chipped. I get rid of those because at, the, at some point, and those I don't even give them to Goodwill at that. These are common enough. There's, there's just no rarity. There's no reason to keep damaged dishware from Red Wing, uh, because it's just inexpensive enough to find replacements for it. Because once it starts chipping, it, food, liquids will start getting into the ceramics. It will start staining it. And you just don't want to have to deal with that. The marks from the stilts tends not to be the issue, and I've never noticed any of the stilt marks get, getting darkened because water is gonna is approaching the uh, holes that were left in that glaze. So just a little sidebar for that. But yes, I am evil. I put my Red Wing dishware from the 50s and 60s in the dishwasher and in the microwave. I'm gonna die soon enough anyway, so let let it kill me. At least I'll have fun eating off of it. Uh, but that is how these are all manufactured. And so all the pieces that you find, let's pull back up the lungs right off the bat. I didn't even try very hard. I could see it. You can kind of see where the, the there's a little bit of discoloration. That's where the still mark is. And then, yep, there's another one right there. And there should be a third one. Okay, the third one is actually harder to find. Oh, there it is. It's way over here on the edge. So again, you're almost always going to find them in sets of three. <laughs> you can turn it into a drinking game if you want. It's a really boring drinking game, but that's, again, it's typically how you're going to know whether you've got something that's just ceramic versus porcelain. Porcelain doesn't have that. The way it's manufactured, you don't have to deal with that. So just one of those weird things about having ceramics. Um, but the, the different shapes, the different pieces, going back to that, before I jump down that rabbit hole, the whole thing about that these came out in the 50s and 60s, a lot of the heaviest marketing was done in the 50s. So a lot of the advertisement really shows that cocktail party, that uh, the bridge games, you know, all that kind of stuff from the that mid-century modern that everyone really likes. It's that lifestyle and all of these pieces start showing up in it. I mean, I don't have the little stand um, when it was, they were first released. Again, these shapes were done in all these different patterns. So the the stands were universal. So if you find a stand, there is no such thing as a Bob White stand versus a smart set stand. That stand would have been unilaterally used between any of the casual sets. Um, but when they first started, they were iron, and then they later turned them into copper because it was more artistic. Uh, but it is copper plated iron. So if, when you see them, uh, if the stands are still magnetic, uh, copper would not be magnetic. So it's just really a copper coating to the iron, which as a result tends to get, because there were open flames being used, like there'd be a place for a little candle to go in there, a little sterno, uh, to heat the coffee pots, the flame would mess with the copper coating. And it, it's usually pitted. Um, I've only seen one or two of them in my life. Uh, those are not as common. Um, and in most cases, the stands are worth more than the actual pieces. So be on the lookout for them. But if they're copper coated, they're usually not going to be, they may not be in great condition. And there's really, to my knowledge, there's no way to fix it. I mean, you maybe if you could find a copper replater that could redo the whole thing, but they're not worth that much money. Um, so you really, it's going to be hard to find one in really, really good condition. But the copper ones are a little bit later, way more attractive. Um, so the earliest ones are going to be the iron. And these, and again, with these cases, even though I showed you the back stamps, which ones were older than the, the age of dishware tends not to be as much of an issue unless they stopped making it at some piece, at some part. And from my, what I can research, all the pieces, at least that I have and that are being promoted, they were pretty much available consistently through 1967. So um, it's not a case where any, anything in particular is like, ooh, I need the earlier backs. Yeah. 
it doesn't really matter. Um, it's going to be really what can you find? Because a lot of times, I actually, somebody, when I uh, posted this, actually one of the viewers on Instagram said that he had this, but he didn't have the stopper and didn't know the stopper existed because there's another picture, which is a little bit smaller. This one has an ice lip to it. So this one would not have a stopper. There'd be no way to put one in here. So the stopper is specific to the, the larger beverage decanter, which has the place for the cradle. This one you can see does not have that like weird lip thing on the bottom. So this is really just designed to be a water pitcher because this, when it's got this little shape to it, this is called an ice, I-C-E, ice lip. Uh, it's to keep the ice ice cubes from falling into your drink and splashing onto your tablecloth. So if you've got something like this, the ice lip would not have a stopper, but when you get into the bigger piece, it does not have the ice lip. That's how the stopper can fit into there. Um, also, what the what the advertising doesn't always reflect is the size of some of the pieces because I showed you this one. So this is the two quart covered casserole. And just check out that lid. I mean, just the cool, it, or just the thought they put into some of this mid-century stuff. I mean, it, I can see why it's as popular as it is. It's just kind of cool and quirky. Again, that shape would also be on the smart set, it'd be on the Lotus, it'd be on everything else that was the in the casual pattern line, the casual, that was the name of the line, casual. Um, and you can see it, it has the little place because this also had a stand. That is the two quart version. This is the four quart version. So, you know, holding up to my head, you can see this is quite a bit bigger than the other one, but in a picture, you're not necessarily gonna be able to tell the difference. And if you're trying to buy them online, and take the lid off so I don't drop it, I'll put them side by side. You can see how different these two sizes are. So, but if you're buying it on eBay, they may not know the quart size. It doesn't say anything on them. You just need to know there's a small one and there's a big one. So you need to get the dimensions because you've got a fairly sizable piece. Like you've got the wingspan on this one is, is big enough. This thing's massive. It's also gorgeous. They're both painted on both sides. So you've got the mother and the baby on one side. And you've got the baby, I guess in the nest. I actually don't know what that thing is next to him, uh, what that is. Is it another bird bending over? I have no idea. But you've got that on both sides. It's the same pattern on both sides of this, mother and baby and baby with nest or lounge chair, whatever he's doing there. Um, oh wait, it's on the dinner plate too. I never noticed that. Dinner plate is a lounge chair too. So I don't know what that, that second one is. That'd be an awful small nest. So I think it's maybe just the backside of another bird. I, I really don't know. We discover things together here on my channel. So anyway, um, actually I'm gonna give you the measurements of this just so you have them for yourself. So the four quart from handle to handle is 14 inches. So that is how big the, the large one is. So that's how I can compare. So, but again, some people, particularly resellers, obviously nothing against resellers. I am one of them. If you, less you have them side by side, you're not going to realize that there is literally a miniaturized version of it in another size. Uh, so it may just get presented as covered casserole or whatever, you know, that you want to cover, call it you're not gonna know there's two different sizes. So the four quart is more rare than the, the two quart, partially because it's so large, it's the one that gets broken uh, because it's heavy. And you've put that, you put a lot of, you you cook a meatloaf or you cook a pot roast in that thing, that thing's gonna become very heavy. So it's gonna get damaged. Uh, and similarly, the lids, just compare the size of the lids, you know, the one fits like within the other, the lids are going to get damaged uh, and lost a lot as well. So a lot of times you'll find them, and I see it all the time, you'll see the casserole listed. It doesn't mention that it doesn't have a lid. It just says casserole, and this is the picture, 
Well, you can tell right by looking at it, there's a lip there. And this is just good, you know, shopping. Anytime you're looking for anything that's going to be dinnerware or anything like that is clues like that. Like, well, there should have been something here because really popular with sugar bowls. A lot of people will say, oh, well, Europeans didn't put covers on their sugar bowls. So this is just an open sugar bowl. Yeah, you're right. They did like open sugar bowls, but an open sugar bowl wouldn't have a freaking rim inside of it waiting for a lid. So you can be as creative as you want, but that's just being a huckster. So be aware of things like that. Again, a reseller may not know that a lid came with it. I'm sure they didn't get the lid and decided to throw it away and sell it without it. Um, but be on the lookout that if you're buying it, you should be able to pick it up at a good price because it's incomplete. So if you want the whole thing, you're going to pay more for it because getting that lid, there's going to be value in that lid because there's going to be a bunch of people that just need lids because they got broken somewhere along the line. And speaking of lids, one of my favorite pieces, the cookie jar. Same thing. I've seen tons of this cookie jar without the lid. You can, and without the lid, because again, it's a cookie jar. Of course, cookie jar is going to have a lid and there's a big lip in here. So it's pretty obvious there's supposed to be a lid. I hold my utensils in this, so I don't need the lid. So I really do have a superfluous lid, but I'm keeping it because it's still more valuable to have the two pieces together. Um, but it's a nice size. I wanted to use them for cookies, but you know, it's just, it's just a cool little thing to, to stick out. It's a nice big size. So it's a fairly, you know, substantial piece to have on display, you know, when you compare it. Um, but again, it has a lid condition is going to be everything. And really, you know, I, I remember discussions early on when I first started reselling. I have, oops, I have always been about condition. You know, there are a lot of people that will sell damaged items and there's nothing wrong with selling a damaged item as long as you're selling it, disclosing the damage. The number of times I bought items, particularly through when YouTube sales were first coming out, the number of times I got something that I purchased from a reseller and it was damaged and it was not disclosed, I was not happy. Um, for something like this, yes, even if this being damaged because these aren't as common, you could still get a decent price, but consider what this should sell for in perfect condition. If it's got a crack in it or a chip or the lid is missing, you should be paying no more than half of that because these are still common enough that you don't, you shouldn't have to pay top price. This isn't 200 years old. This is not a rarity. This is not something you can't find another one. There's, this is one that insurance value is not going to send this through the roof. Uh, Dr. Lori is not going to say a new one of these is worth 10 times more than they actually are because they are out there. I have one of them. And if you want to spend 10 times what it's worth, I'll sell, I'll sell you mine. Okay, I'll go find another one. Uh, but that's the cookie jar. One of my favorite, one of my favorite pieces, but my absolute favorite piece, the hors d'oeuvre quail. So this is literally an hors d'oeuvre server. So it is in the shape of an actual quail. So no big surprise. Yes, this is part of the casual line, but there is no smart set version of this. <laughs> this is unique to the Bob, the Bob White uh, pattern because it is literally the quail. Um, but what they've done is they've uh, drilled hole or not drilled. They would have done it at the time it was fired. They would have poked holes and then glazed the over um, places that the toothpicks can go into. So you could you skewer a piece of salami, skewer a piece of block cheese, Cuba cheese. You put it on here at the center of your little dining table, your cut, your little coffee table, wherever your your sideboard, and your friends could come in and pick up a pre a pre skewed pre skewered uh, hors d'oeuvre or fill it with the blank toothpicks, and they can just go spike their own food. Um, I just think he's cute by himself. I. He's, he has not been on display, but if once I do decide to put him on display, I probably won't put the toothpicks in him because you can kind of see, you know, it's it's not super clear, but the way you, you just think about it, the way these holes were made and then glazed in, it dictates how these toothpicks are going to fit. So like the toothpicks on this side, maybe the person drilling was taller. I don't know. They are all very straight. And the toothpicks on this side are all very much at an angle. <laughs> so I don't know why that is. It's just, I know, you know, from a physics side, I understand what's happening is that for some reason, these holes were drilled more vertically and these were drilled more at an angle. 
but as a result, it makes the bird look a little funny. So I think he would look funny if I put food in him because it would be, some of them are actually like, these two are really close together. If I had two blocks of cheese, they would be touching at the top. So it, it's, I'm not sure if there was a map for how the hill, holes got drilled. I don't, I don't know the details of that, but he's still my favorite piece because he just looks cool. And you take out all the little individual pieces. He is just kind of like a little piece of sculpture. And I just think he's a lot of fun. And he's very similar to probably my second favorite pieces, the salt and pepper shaker, because you've got this you're kind of in the same shape, the tall bird, the tall quail, uh, and this one, like, again, look at how he's going to sit. He's going to sit flat. So this one basically is pecking the ground. So how cute is that on your dinner table? You have a little salt and pepper shaker that just looks like this. Again, unique to Bob White. So these shapes are going to be unique to this pattern. Um, there is a salt and pepper shaker uh, that I mentioned earlier. I don't have a, a piece of them. Uh, uh, I don't have them, but I'll show a picture. I think I might have a picture in one of the ads. Um, but this is uh, the shape. This exact shape of the stopper is the exact shape of the salt and pepper shakers. So it's it's still a unique, a cool shape. I showed well, I showed the picture of the smart set. Um, so that is available in other patterns. It's cool. But how could you pass up a salt and pepper shaker that looks like the actual bird that's of your pattern? I mean, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, a couple other pieces that I've got, you know, Mr. Dramatur is all but entertaining. So you've got the creamer and the sugar. So again, great shapes. Like the this is just you know a much smaller version of the larger two pictures. Got that kind of that slanted handle with a really cool, sexy arch to it. Um, this one has the, uh, hey, look, it's got, it's got that lounge chair on the front again. It kind of looks like Blue's Clues chair, doesn't it? Um, but it's got that on the front. And then the back is just the little grassland pattern. And I, and I just love the little blue shulcock uh, dandelion, you know, that, that just touch of turquoise blue to the creamer. And then you've got the covered sugar. Again, it got a lip, so don't tell me it's, it's an open sugar got a lip to it so and then this one the lip actually is a place for the spoon so you actually have a place to uh, keep the spoon in your sugar again painted on the front okay i'm obsessed with the blues clues chair i need to look at that again uh and then the back does have the design but it's just the grass uh designs so that's the creamer and the sugar again we're all about entertaining so we've got the handled tidbit tray now, what I, find about, what I find interesting about the tidbit tray, and I'm going to assume that I have an original version of it, not a aftermarket, um, but the tidbit tray is uh, brass. And as I said, the stands were copper and uh, iron, not brass. So it is possible this is a dinner plate that has been turned into a tidbit tray, and which is not a big surprise. I mean, even you're looking at the back, the back stamp has the same 212 number. So this is a dinner plate. So that that I know. But what I don't know is was this done in the factory or did someone do this as a, like a craft project after the fact? Um, the fact that it's brass does make me think it could be an aftermarket. It could be something that was just done last year for all I know. Um, but maybe it was done because I've not actually found the tidbit tray in any of the um, marketing pieces that break down the patterns, but I've never found anything that actually lists all of the pieces that were available. Like the only reference I could find was that there were over 60, 60, 60 different unique pieces available in the Bob White pattern alone. So it's possible this was a factory made piece. It's possible it was done after bar. doesn't matter. It's still all about entertaining and it is a cool piece, you know, as a tidbit tray. Uh, but again, just like the lung um, relish tray, Check out the boomerang relish tray. I mean, could we be more mid-century modern? So we've got the mama and the baby. No blues clues chair in this one. Um, it's just the shape is absolutely fantastic. And again, I found the dinner plates first. So the dinner plates were just kind of cute and I liked the pattern. I've said this before. I've lost quite a bit of weight for those who don't know my history. I used to weigh 325 pounds. I'm now down to 170. Um, so I've lost over 150 pounds, um, but I kind of felt the quail was my spirit animal. It was short, squatty, waddly, you know, it was me. Um, I'm not quite the quail anymore, but I still like the quail. So I like the dinner plate, but then you start getting into pieces like this. 
again, I understand why people like mid-century modern because this is sexy. This is cool. And I can see why people would want to collect things simply because you've got shapes like this. This, looks, this is fantastic. Uh, and it has a quail. So how can you pass it up? There's a lot of uh, general, like entertaining pieces. They're also just serving pieces. Um, so there's this kind of middle sized platter. And actually, this one's considered the small platter because this one is considered the large platter. Now, this one I think is actually, I didn't find a reference to it as this. I literally only found reference to calling it the large platter. But I do think this is the meat platter because I don't know if you're going to be able to tell. If you kind of look at the reflection, you can see there are grooves in that and there's a well here. So it's like there's a low part right in there that would have collected the juices. So I think this would have been for your carved piece of, pot, of pot roast, whatever, uh, so that the, the meat was not resting in its juices. It would pool down there. You see those on high end silver serving uh, uh, salvers, things like that. This whole idea of a meat tray, but when they sold it, you also see on the back a little bit different. These are very, very um, pronounced lips because there was also a holder for these. Um, so there was a, it was a double holder and it was two flames would have been underneath it to keep the entire platter warm. Uh, so again, I do not have uh, any of the, the holders, um, but size wise, this one kind of gives itself away there's no reason for these because uh, you could have just made it flat on the back or at least oval on the back like this one. So the fact that there's two, that kind of gives, is kind of a giveaway that there's a reason that it looks like that. Then it's not just one big oval lip. It's so that it sits securely in that flame, uh, that flame base. And again, this is one of the more valuable pieces because it really, even when you were buying it, it would have been expensive at the time because it's so much bigger. Um, there weren't as many of these made. And then if you find the tray, the tray was sold separately, or the warmer, the stand was sold separately. So you could buy the tray without ever buying the stand. So there just aren't as many of these big stands. So this, they can, the whole set I have seen online recently for over $300, um, you know, they can go for quite a bit, quite a bit of money. Uh, but some nice over here. The one that I don't have, it's a, I think overall size, I want to say it's about as long as this one, but it's not as um, it's not as deep. It's uh, it's kind of more of a a collapsed oval, and it's considered the bread tray, and it actually has three vignettes on it. Um, it's one that I've never found in the wild. Uh, so, and I, like I said, I bought a couple of the smaller things online. I think I bought the salt and pepper shakers online because they were cheap to ship. Um, so, I, you know, at some point I might look for that, keep looking for that bread, the bread tray, because it's just kind of a, a cool shape. Um, so again, those are a couple, couple, a couple extra pieces from the collection. So I'll pop in, I, I hopefully I've already done this or I might show them here. I'll show, I'll, I'll drop in a couple of the advertisements that I saw. Uh, some of them were just ads in general, but some of them did do a breakdown, but I do want to, you know, go ahead and cover this a little bit to just, again, cover some of the shapes that I know exist. So there's the, um, this is the cruet set. So it looks like the salt and pepper shakers, but again, with an iron stand, I don't have that one. Um, but that one is kind of a cool, a cool piece. And again, the stand would have been across everything that was part of the casual uh, line. There's the covered butter dish. I don't technically have that one either. Um, some of the individuals, there's the boomerang. Oh, look, the tidbit tray. I answered my own question. I hadn't even noticed that. Um, so the tidbit tray is OEM. That's cool. Uh, there's the salt and pepper shakers. I showed them a little bit easier to see with that other pattern, but you can see the shape is again, very similar to the stopper. And we're to the next page. Cookie jar, there's that double uh, warmer. So the one for that big meat platter. And then I don't have that little tray that the, the creamer and sugar sit on. What I don't know about that, because I haven't ever seen it before, what I don't know is if that has ridges or if it's just like a little tiny tray that they just sit on or if there's like little lips so that you could carry it without them slipping. If they had the little lips on it, that would actually be pretty cool. Um, there is the hors d'oeuvre server. You can see he's sitting in an hors d'oeuvre tray. Uh, it's a segmented tray. I've seen those before. I don't have one, 
uh, but there's four segments to it. And then the center is just another shallow bowl, but you can put the hors d'oeuvre uh, bird in it. So if you don't have it, it's just like a little crudite set. You just have five holes to fill with veggies or cheese or whatever you've got. But if you've got the little crudite, you've got the little um, hors d'oeuvre bird, you can set him in, that, in the middle of that. And then there's the little um, salt and pepper, bird-shaped salt and peppers um, there. I can't say prices have gone crazy. I will, I can guarantee you, I probably, I don't believe I spent more than 50 on anything. And even 50, I'm staring at the huge casserole thinking that he might've cost me a little bit more, like more like 45. But I don't think I would have paid 45 for him because what am I ever going to cook in this damn thing? Um, so I, it had to have been a good price. So I have a feeling I probably paid like 35 maybe. Um, I know some of the pieces. I remember one, one thing I bought. I want to say the bigger, the isolip pitcher came with like, it, like it was kind of set, it was sold as a set uh, or a package. It wasn't really set, but like the, there was that. Maybe one of the bowls. I think there's three, three or four pieces, but I only wanted two. There was only two pieces out of it because the other two I already had and I didn't need them. Um, and it happened, I was at an antique mall and the vendor happened to be there. So saw me looking at it, saw me totally jonesing over like, are there any chips? Is there any damage to these things? Because the minute something has damage, it's going back on the shelf. Like I don't even care to look at the price at that point. Uh, so I was looking the the, I know the picture was one of the pieces and the picture was in perfect condition, but I spent a little bit too much time looking at it. And so they saw that, but what they wanted for the entire set was something like 65 or $75, like way more than I was willing to spend. Because again, two of the pieces I didn't even need, I was just going to either resell them or donate them. Um, so it's like, once I saw the price, I'm like, yeah, no, moving on. And they're like, oh, what are you willing to spend? And I said, I don't want to insult you because I really only want the two pieces. I'm like, would you split them off and let me have the two pieces? You could keep the other two and you could continue to try to resell them. They didn't even want to do that. They're like, no, like we've had these for a really long time. They don't really sell well. And that's a good indication. Like they're very common around here. Um, they said they really hadn't had anyone. So they did not want to just keep two pieces, particularly the most common. So they're like, well, what do you offer? And I think I offered them 25 bucks and they said, deal. Okay. So I got base. I remember it was like two thirds off or 75% off or something. It was whatever they had listed. That's what I ended up paying. Um, so again, price wise, you can get these things for relatively inexpensive, but again, I don't have some of the rarer pieces. Like I don't have any of the stands. I mean, now that I, I kind of started looking around for them, if I could find the copper stand to this, I'd probably be willing to pay up for it. I probably still wouldn't want to spend more than like 50 because as it is, this thing is so tall, it's actually hard to display because it doesn't fit on a shelf uh, because it typically, be, it's, the shelves are tighter than this. So if I want to keep the stopper in it, it's actually, it's problematic. Um, but, you know, it's one of those cases, uh, it is a fun collection to have. I, I would, I, the only time some of the serving pieces have been out is if I have people over for dinner or for like a, you know, I don't do cocktail parties, but for like hors d'oeuvres or whatever, just friends out, I'll pull them out because they're fun little conversation pieces. You know, even if I'm just like throwing beef jerky on a platter, Hey, here you go. Um, there's, they're cute to have. It's a fun collection to build up. I haven't really added anything lately, um, because I don't run into the rare stuff and I've got all the common stuff, but that's what I wanted to show. And I will say, I did not know about the Playboy connection. I thought that was hilarious. Um, so I will, uh, I, I should have already shown the picture, uh, carefully edited it out. So I'm not, uh, demonetized on YouTube. Um, but the fact that someone even had the wherewithal to create a vignette like that as an, as a centerfold, it was kind of tasteful, you know, that it's, it's, uh, things are not the way they once were. Uh, but anyway, I didn't know that. So like some of the stuff that I shared today, I literally just started, I just discovered as I was preparing for this video. So I hope you enjoyed it. So it ended up probably being a little bit longer. I'm going to edit some of this out, but you know, it's probably going to be, it was longer than I'd anticipated. So it ended up not, not being a shallow dive. Maybe it wasn't a deep dive or like in a mid dive, but it's a return to Trusty's vintage deep dive. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to say I'll do another one. Um, 
that I always intended to do more, just, you know, life got in the way. And really the impetus for this one was when I had all of these things pulled out for that McGillicuddy photo shoot for uh, Instagram. I'm like, I don't want to put all this away yet. <laughs> so I decided let's do a video. So I did all the research. So there you go. Another piece I've got. And so I just want to thank you again for watching the video. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for putting your trust in Trusty Huckster. And we will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.